Ezt a segítünk start. Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth and the final episode of TalkX season one. I'm Disha, a technical writer here at Razorpay and your host for today. In our previous episode, we explored technical writing in the finance domain, discussing challenges, regulatory compliance and strategies for user trust. Our panelists highlighted shared responsibilities, accuracy, and the role of continuous learning. In this episode, we will focus on the internationalization and localization in tech writing, where we'll explore the intricate world of adapting technical content for global audiences. We'll also discuss the challenges, strategies, and best practices involved in technical documentation to reach users across different cultures and languages. When discussing internationalization and localization in tech writing, I'd like to mention that the tech writing team at Razorpay launched Curlect Docs, our first international documentation, tailored to the Malaysian audience last year. We achieved a remarkable CSAT of 81%, which has been consistent so far. Additionally, we conduct user interviews to stay proactive and incorporate any necessary changes based on feedback. Looking ahead, we are excited about authoring more international docs and expanding our reach to serve our global audience. Let's jump back to the topic. Joining us today are three incredible experts in the field of tech writing. First up, we have Vinita Jagannathan. Vinita is a seasoned tech writer with 10 years of IT industry experience, currently serving as the lead tech writer at Razorpay. When she is not immersed in documentation, you can find her crafting short stories or indulging in Netflix binges. Welcome, Vinita. Thank you. Our next panelist is Palguna MS. Palguna works as a senior tech writer with 10 plus years of experience in translating complex technical concepts into clear and user-friendly documentation. He has worked across diverse industries from technology, software, development to healthcare consistently adapting to new subjects and delivering high-quality documentation. Welcome, Palvana. Thank you, Disha. Last but not the least, we have Shetra Shetty. Shetra is an associate tech writer at Razorpay and a proud computer science graduate. With 1.5 years of dedicated experience, Shetra led the charge on the Curlic project, our first international project. Beyond the documentation, Shetra brings a unique touch, sketching portraits and indulging in the joy of crafting delightful dishes. Welcome, Shetra. Thank you, Disha. All right. With introductions done, let's dive into the discussion. My first question is to Vinita. As someone who was alerted about Razorpay's expansion into international markets and the need for documentation tailored to Malaysian audience, I'm curious to know how you think internationalization impacts creating technical documentation, and could you also share your strategies for making content adaptable to diverse audiences? Sure. So first, let's look at what is internationalization, uh, or as they call it, I-18N, the short form. So uh, basically, in technical documentation context, it means that we have to create flexible content that can be easily adapted to different languages, different regions, different countries, etc. Now, uh, let's look at the curlic requirement that we got, right? So Razorpay is an Indian business that we know, and it had acquired a Malaysian company called Curlic, and now they wanted to pitch Razorpay's products to the Malaysian businesses. So which means the Razorpay products had to be internationalized, as well as the documentation also needs to be internationalized. So this was the unique requirement we got. And we understood at that point that the documentation we had then was not going to suffice because it was very India specific, right? And uh, let's look at some of the unique elements, you know, specific to India. Of course, the currency is there, INR versus Ringgit. But we also have to look one level deeper. We have unique concepts for India, like UPI, we have NACH, Paper NACH, we have Section 80G of the Income Tax Act. All of these are sprinkled across Razorpay documentation. So, and we have, you know, at that point of time, we had 1,300 plus pages. So imagine going to all of these pages and figuring out where is UPI present, where is Paper Natch present? Do we need to show this to a Malaysian audience or not? Do we need to hide it? Do we just need to add a banner saying, you know, UPI is not applicable in Malaysia? So we had to consider all this and come up with an approach. How do we tackle this? And there are basically two ways of doing it. Either you show a global documentation, that is a one-size-fits-all documentation, 
which is going to be there for all countries, right? Whether you are from India or Malaysia or US or Indonesia, the same documentation is going to be used by all set of users. Or the second is you have specific documentation for India and specific documentation for Malaysia. But again, before you select any of these two approaches, you have to keep some factors in mind, like user experience, scalability, maintainability. Mm -hmm. um, now let's look at approach one, which is you know global one size fits all documentation. User experience is definitely going to take a hit because the same content is going to be shown to different users across globes. Now imagine showing UPI to someone in Malaysia. They won't even know what that means. It's going to baffle them. You wouldn't want to show it, but that's what will happen with the global approach. But scalability and maintainability is going to be very easy. It's just one documentation. You just keep scaling across countries. But look, looking at the second approach, user experience is going to be great because the document is tailored to the specific needs of that country's users. But scalability and maintainability is a problem. Suppose Razorpin next expands to Indonesia, goes to Singapore. Then do we keep cloning the documentation repository across for each country? Then imagine if you know there's a change in one product, you have to keep updating the same content in these multiple uh, you know, repositories. The tech writers are going to be very angry with this, right? It's not going to be an easy task. Imagine duplicating the same screenshot in these different repositories, same content, etc. So these were the two approaches we had to consider. And what we went for was a hybrid approach. We said that we are going to have only one unique you know, set of information. We will adapt it. We will make some changes to it. We will have specific, you know, code elements and components, which will ensure that it is a single source of information, but the content will be tailored, will be curated according to the each country's needs. So razorpay.com slash talks will have India specific content. Curlic.com slash talks is going to have Malaysia specific content. And this is what worked out for Razorpay so far, as Tisha has mentioned with the CSAT and all, it does look promising. However, for different organizations, there are going to be different set of needs. Like if a country, you know, if an organization is going to say China or Japan, then translation comes into the picture. Then there's a different set of processes to follow. You need translators, you need reviewers. It's a whole different process altogether. And also we have to look at the time we have for the project. What is the scope of the project? What are the resources the organization is going to give to the tech writing team for all this? So we can make this decision only after considering all this. And that's how we have to come up with a strategy. So this is how I feel we can strategize for such things. Thank you, Anita. That was very well explained from carefully understanding the doc requirement and also noticing what is applicable for the Malaysian audience. That was very well explained. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, moving on. My next question is to Palguna. When it comes to localizing content, having a well-defined process is very crucial. Can you outline your approach to localizing content and how do you collaborate with translators and other stakeholders to ensure the success of these projects? Oh uh, yeah, Disha, certainly. So <clears throat> what happens is, you know, uh, the content creation. So uh, in my opinion, uh, and uh, from my previous experiences, uh, what I think is, you know, localization is a part of content creation. It is an additional step of content creation, right? So as we all know, it's a, a content creation is uh, different steps of DDLC, document development life cycle. So localization is one of the part of it. So if you are writing to a, uh, if you're writing in a normal or, or in the uh, neutral language like English, you don't have to you know much uh, keep certain things in mind for localization. But when your content is getting localized, there are few things that you need to be, you know, uh, uh, to be very much uh, aware of uh, in each stage of DDLC, let's say while prepare uh, while 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 you're preparing for a content, the very first point is knowing your audience. So it's like uh, not like the way we have actually localized here. It's like Malaysia. We have changed the currency and uh, you know some changes we did, uh, and we have hidden UPI this time. But when your content is uh, getting translated into a different language altogether. So that is where the challenges comes in, right? So every sentence or the every word you write will, will be translated. So I have worked in such a, uh, a company where you, your entire content used to get translated for different uh, languages, like say Japanese, Spanish, Chinese. So during those, uh, you know, when, when that is happening, so you have to be extra cautious while writing your content, right? So uh, the approach would be for this uh, content creation, what you, what you should actually do is first you know your audience first right uh to which region i'm writing to 
right? So you might your your content might get translated into Japanese as well as into Spanish at the same time. So these are two different regions. Right? One is Asian and one is European, right? So uh, knowing your audience actually help you to you know fine tune your content, right? So in some region, you know, uh, giving a direct tone tone matters a lot. Their culture differs, right? So uh, that way you can actually plan for the content creation uh, if you know your audience better, right? So the next step would be uh, Vinita brought up I eighteen yen, so which is a kind of a very good thing, right? So your your content in such a way that uh, should be in, in such a way that you have adapted all the internal uh, internationalization principles, right? So you adapt, you know the culture of uh, the audience that you are writing to, and then you try to adapt. Right, so some of the technical terminology will be extremely difficult difficult for you to trans translate. Right, so that way you have to know the culture of the region that you are uh, writing to and come up with you know use a consistent style of writing. Your tone should be consistent across uh, your document because you have one version of document which will be translated to multiple languages. So that way your tone has to be very consistent and you try to use as much as less as possible jargons or try to avoid jargons if possible right uh, there may be some uh, words which which would give ambiguous meanings as well so you will have to try to avoid those next point would be collaborating with translators see if you have an in house translator then that's a different uh, thing it, it's very few companies has that right so uh, most of them what do they do is they outsource this translations or they just you know uh, put the text in the google and they'll translate it so when it comes to translating the entire document, then you will have to outsource it. So now again, there will be few things that needs to be uh, you know considered here. A non-disclosure agreement should be there, and you know uh, you'll have to you know explain all the features or the concept to your translator, right? All the specific requirement to the translator. I'm writing to this particular region, boss. You will have to be extra cautious while translating things, while while, while translating a sentence, which should not give a different meaning. So you will have to give the specific requirement to the translator. Let them you know, let them understand what exactly the concept is. What is the product all about? You will have to make them understand. Let them try it. That's when the translation happens in a proper way. I'm talking about the content translating into the you know uh, different language altogether. So next is like again, you talk to your stakeholders, explain them that. The, there is an additional step uh, which is coming up as a localization, so which would take some time. Also, establish a good communication channel with the translation team so that you, all their queries being resolved as quickly as possible. So once the translation happens, right? So content analysis is another part. You know, you just have to go through the entire content that is actually you know tailored to the particular region. Let's say Europeans, you know, see the tone in a different way, and the Asians see the tone in a different way. So what you have to do is you'll have to actually contact some cultural experts to make sure your content is tailored in a proper way for those particular regions. So that way you do the content analysis. Next is like quality assurance. Let's say as I said, jargons should not give inappropriate meaning to some specific region where they don't want to hear that, right? So best way of avoiding is come up with a style guide you know for uh, to, that that outlines the your writing conventions the formatting standards you have you come up with a style guide you know you maintain it and you share that with the uh, target audience so they'll understand uh, in in a specific words if you have to say maintain a glossary which will explain the exact terms uh, that's being used in your documentation so certain technical terms you know you will have to use certain jargons which is inevitable so you will in, in that case, you will have to maintain a glossary and explain that in the in that particular page. And lastly, after you publish your content, right? So you get all the approvals from the stakeholders, uh, cultural experts, translators. You know, sometimes translators might want you to reduce the words you have, might want you to adapt, uh, you know, uh, for the design. They may want you to you know, change your content depending on the design. So uh, after everything once it's been published you will have to maintain it so that is one more part right so when you have when you have a patch releases uh you will have to you know uh add certain content into your existing contents again so that version uh versioning should also be there so this is the approach i think uh we can follow for uh localization when your content is getting translated to different language altogether 
Thanks, Balgana. Thank you for outlining the process in uh, so uh, in so much detail. Uh, I think your experience is definitely reflecting in your answer. Uh, my next question is to Shetra. As a newcomer in the tech editing industry, how did you approach creating technical documentation for a foreign audience, considering the language barriers, cultural differences, and varying levels of technical expertise among in international users? Um, yeah, thank you, Disha. Uh, yes, as a newcomer to the technical writing industry, it was very important for me to understand the process. The pro uh, the approach, I would say, it was pretty similar to how we document for a new feature or a product. So, for example, when we document a new product or a pre feature, we do an extensive research to understand the product. So, and in this case, it was very important for me to understand the end users. That was the Malaysian audience. So firstly, I started working on the competitor analysis. Uh, we dug deep into what our competition looked like, such as PayPal, Adyne, and Stripe, of course. This helped in understanding um, what the users were looking for, the kind of transaction that was happening there, and who's using these services. Um, that helped in understanding or building a solid understanding. The second would be language adaptation. So here at Lazy Pay, like Vanita mentioned, we got over 1,300 articles. So after completing a thorough competitor analysis and identifying the key parameters, we initiated the process of tailoring the articles for Malaysian users. We recognize the need uh, to replace words like GSP, KYC, and RBI, uh, and adjusting things to match what's going on with the local money there. Uh, the third point would be adaptation checklist. So um, I made a simple checklist post competitive analysis addressing currency variation, tailoring examples like naming conventions that are more local to the place for a smoother experience for the Malaysian users. The fourth point would be content uh, enhancement. That is, once working with the competitor analysis, uh, we understood that there was a need that uh, to introduce new content elements such as FPX, which is similar to net banking here, and some more dedicated uh, you know, wallet pages, especially for Malaysian uh, users such as is, um, touch and go and grab pay and so on. So content enhancement, yes. The fifth point was um, a reflective evaluation. That is, in looking over my work, I used this checklist that I think all, almost all the users used, or the writers used. This careful check made sure that everything that was authored fit well with the Malaysian uh, users. And the most important key point that I stressed on was to make sure that it's not just about translating words, but um, going beyond translation. And it's very important to establish genuine connection with the audience that we write for. So I think these were some of the approaches I kept in mind before um, going on with the project. Thank you, Shetra. I think in uh, such a short span of time, you've definitely cracked how to document uh, uh, for international users. That was very well articulated. Uh, next up, let's have a discussion. This question is open to all our panelists. You can raise your hand and go ahead. So with the rise of AI and machine, uh, machine translation, how do you see the future of internationalization and localization in tech writing evolving? And what are the opportunities and challenges associated with these technologies? I can take that. Sure, Shabana, go ahead. Um, so, so um, as you can see that, um, of course, chat GPT and there are several other AI based bots available today and uh, several other tools that many of the organizations are using, right? So uh, with as we have seen that although AI is great at many things, it's automating a lot of things, it, it is giving answers to many of our questions, it is still not there when it comes to translation, right? Uh, of course, it can do uh, the job maybe up to 80%, but still there is a need for human intervention to do that final polishing before we can actually share that content, the translated content. Uh, to the users. Now, having said that, uh, it can definitely automate, it can definitely reduce the cost involved with translation. In fact, many of the organizations, although there is a need for localization, they don't really do the translation because of the cost involved. If you look at the way translations 
have been ha happening uh, you know traditionally it's like there is a set of translators who look at the content they make they do the translations and there is of course the cost is the pricing is based on per word translation which makes the you know the entire activity extremely expensive versus the benefits that it reaps while uh, Again, having said that, there is definitely a need for translation. And with AI coming in, um, I very strongly feel that um, it can reduce the cost to a large extent. Uh, what I mean by that, that we can use these AI-based tools to do the initial uh, translation, right? And like I said, it gets perhaps 80 to 85 percent of accuracy level and then we can bring in a human uh, you know person a translator a local person who can make the translations and uh, go go with the final copy of it uh, so uh, to give you an answer ai is definitely going to help uh, in reducing cost it's um, going to make the tech writers more efficient and also address a long uh, pending uh, you know ask of the users where they have been asking for translated content uh, just to give you a very you know simple example that we created a, a, a video uh, on refunds uh, which was done in both english and hindi i know vinita smiling there and uh, as per the numbers that we see on youtube exactly the same content only the language was english versus hindi the english video got 12k uh, hits while the hindi video got 25k hits exactly double and this was published two years back and that was one experiment that we did and, and now obviously we could not do that for many more videos because of the cost and the effort involved but we see there is a genuine need for translated content but just because of the effort and the time and the money involved people are not doing it but with ai i think many of the folks will start using it uh, more so you can see more translated content and more translated videos Thank you. Thank you, Shaparna. Anyone from our panelists would want to add? Yeah, um, I definitely agree with Shipana when she says the speed is going to increase, the efficiency is going to increase. If earlier we could, a uh, human writer could perhaps complete a project in days and months, AI is going to do it in a matter of few minutes and hours. So definitely the speed has increased, efficiency has increased. Also, I think there'll be more consistency in the terms of, you know, things. Of course, we can always give, uh, you know, the style guides and reference materials to translators, but human errors might seep in. We might see sometimes that the consistent style is not being followed, but with AI, I think that will be reduced to a great extent. Uh, but having said that, well, there are pros, there are also cons. Uh, one major con which I feel is the data security. So it is not very safe to put confidential information on these open source AI tools that we have. So uh, we have to be wary of that. But I think uh, if we take that into consideration, if there are more you know, proprietary API tools or paid API tools which guarantee the security of the data that we are going to be adding to it, then I think it is going to definitely be a great game changer in the in, in this area. Palguna and Shetra, do you want to add? Uh, yep. Yeah. So uh, I agree with both uh, what Pinata and uh, Shripana said. Uh, AI, see, uh, it, it has its own advantages uh, and uh, challenges as well. So advantages, I would like to say, is like you can incorporate our, uh, within the CMS, right? So as and when you write your content, uh, the AI will help you to translate it then and there for you. So that, again, reduces the cost maintains the consistency all these are kind of yeah of course advantages but challenges again so it, it becomes extremely difficult for an ai when it comes to contextual help or when you're writing to context uh, sensitive documents right so it might not able to understand the exact context you're writing to right so uh, nowadays you see a lot of contextual uh, help guides on on uh, incorporated within the uh, softwares right so that becomes maybe uh, with, with the kind of version we have now, uh, that becomes extremely difficult for an AI to you know give the contextual understanding of the document that you are writing. Uh, also, one more thing is like, again, cultural sensitivity. What I have experienced is like, you know, certain uh, jargon, certain things, you know, uh, let's say, <clears throat> as we all know, like uh, we have worked on Malaysia. So it's like certain features were not available for Malaysia. Uh, wherein we had to add it. So those kind of cultural sensitivity or those kind of regional specific features, AI may not be able to help us with. So again, uh, that needs an, a writer's intervention to you know, resolve all these uh, issues maybe. So that's my point on AI thing. 
I think the team covered most of the points. But uh, again, seeing with respect to the challenges and uh, talking about the future of internationalization, um, human touch is very vital in understanding diverse audiences. And I think AI, AI might not be able to do that. And that is the most important aspect. So I think AI will fail in that. So yeah, that's important. Yeah, I would like to add here. So just this morning, I just was trying out. So we have this sentence, right? Save card number. I just um, asked chat GPT to convert that in Hindi and give. And it did not give me card number, bachaye card number, save kare. First one is wrong anyway. It gave me card number sahiji. And I was like, what does sahiji even mean? I don't understand what it means. So definitely if there was a human writer, it's going to give, you know, context specific as all of the panel members have mentioned. It's going to give context sensitive, uh, you, you know, content, right? Thank you. Thank you so much for all your inputs. I think uh, it was a very good discussion on AI and of course it's always going to go hand in hand. Okay, before we get back to the discussion, let's take a quick break with a fun question. If software localization was a food dish, what would it be and why? I'd say it would be like a birthday cake because it's customized for you with your name on it. I'd say it's uh, going to be Pani Puri. <laughs> With different names and different, you know, the flavor and things, a little bit of it changes based on the local, based on the location, the city. I don't know why I feel like uh, software localization would look like a khichdi. <laughs> it's a mix of everything and at the end uh, it tastes good. So <laughs> yeah, I feel like khichdi. So if I can like edit like like edit the question a little bit and say like internationalization instead of localization and say gulab jamun because gulab jamun is the internationalized kind. <laughs> There's gulab jamun everything, everything available in gulab jamun flavor. So, you know, it's like, it's it's also like Nolan Good, like there's Nolan Good ice cream, like until I had it, it was beyond my imagination. <laughs> It being developed into a flavor to an extent where you can just sort of apply it like butter on anything. So, yeah. I think Nishta's answer is giving me other ideas where I'll say dosa because you have 99 varieties of dosa, all made on dosa, but then each with different flavors. So the core of it remains strong. The flavors of it will differ across geographies. Okay, I would say a, a, a well-blended cocktail, maybe. If your uh, you know, content is properly translated, it's, it, it gives you a proper, you know, a nice kick. And if it is, you know, messed up, then you are completely messed up. Uh, exactly, LIT. Uh, I hope nobody is hungry after the discussion, but uh, my takeaway is going to be khichdi. Love the khichdi answer, hard relate to khichdi. All right, let's move on to our next question. Uh, to Vinita, how do you collaborate with international teams and subject matter experts to gather insights and feedback for improving internationalization efforts? Um, yeah, so it's definitely very important to collaborate with international teams. Uh, because they are the ground force, they are meeting the customers day in and day out. They are our eyes and ears. They have the pulse of the customer. So definitely they have a treasure of information with them. We should definitely be interacting with them often. And at RazorPay, we have been doing it right from the outset, right from the pre-writing phase where we had to research about the change. We had been in touch with them. Uh, we have spoken to the PMs, the subject matter experts, the developers to understand exactly what is the nature of change in the documentation that needs to be made. Um, so, for example, I think the example of FPX that Shetra mentioned, we were not even aware that something like that existed. And then the uh, you know PM brought up and said they don't have net banking, they have FPX. Then we had to go back and see how others, our competitors, have documented it. What should we be able? To, what should we be including? How is that going to affect the sample code, the integration sample codes and stuff? 
So definitely pre-writing phase itself, we have to talk to the, uh, the international teams. Second is the writing and uh, you know the review where after the writing is done, we again go back to the developers and the PMs and say, can you please review and let us know if this is meeting the requirements, if we have covered everything, is it accurate? And I think in those times itself, we get feedback, we get uh, feedback that how we can tailor the content better. And finally, after publishing again, where um, the work doesn't end there, we basically again have to go back to the teams and ask them about, you know, feedback, post the documentation, go live. And sales teams have been doing that at Razorpay. They come back to us directly on our Slack channels and say, hey, no, no, you know what, you can perhaps add this FAQ for, you know, as a workaround for Malaysian users. This is not there for India. So this is the kind of immediate insights we get from the sales teams directly on our Slack channels. Um, then we also do have the embedded feedback systems on docs that users can themselves come and say, uh, you know what, maybe this change is required in your documentation. Again, we can derive insights from these responses we get and you know find some action items and work on those. And the other thing that we have been doing, I think we already mentioned it earlier, is the interaction with the you know Malaysian developers themselves. So again, we reached out to the support teams, the sales team and said, hey, we want to talk to a few Malaysian developers who have already integrated Razorpay products using our documentation. We want to talk to those people and understand what their perception of docs is. Was it helpful? Did they require additional handholding? Was this sufficient? So uh, in these conversations with developers also, we got some feedback uh, where there were some, you know, this is done well, this can be done. You can perhaps add, you know, a certain maybe an API playground can be added or something of that sort. We definitely got very good constructive feedback from the Malaysian developers. And this is a cycle I think we should keep continuing. We should have more of these conversations with developers directly to understand uh, what they feel, uh, you know, can be done better in a documentation. So this um, connects with these international teams. It's not just after the documentation goal, but it is in each phase of the documentation. It's what I feel. Rightly said, Vanita. We can safely say that uh, feedback is the backbone to a quality documentation. All yeah, right. we do have 81% score, which is showing that we are definitely going in the right direction. So yeah, that's boosting our confidence. Of course. Moving on, uh, my next question is to Palguna again. In your previous role, uh, you worked on documentation for various languages, as you mentioned, Spanish, Japanese, and others. Could you share the challenges you encountered while localizing technical documentation, and how did you overcome them? Uh, yeah, so from my previous experience, uh, you know, uh, I, I was completely new to the technical writing domain uh, altogether at that time, so I started my new job as a tech writer. So it was completely new to me. So technical writing itself was new to me. Like, how do I start? How do I land? So on top of that, I have been given three to four documents, you know, wherein I had to write uh, for Japanese, Spanish, and you know, uh, Dutch as well, I believe. So uh, you know, I I, I was I, I really had no clue of uh, how do I start, how do I end it. I'm like, okay, let's start, let's writing. Uh, then after my content uh, done, so it went to the you know uh, outsourced uh, translators that's when i got to know certain things right so you have one uh, source like uh, we used to follow data uh, architecture there so for content reuse is a uh, it's it's a kind of must there you know uh, try to uh, you know reduce as much words as possible so these were the kind of things that they follow uh, that is where the conditional formatting comes in. No, now we have show ifs, so we call it as conditional formatting. Actually, um, you will have one source of content, you know, which will be, uh, you know, translated to all the different languages. And uh, when it comes to ja Japanese, right, certain features of your uh, product are not available there. So that is where you use your conditional formatting tags to hide them for specific regions. So this one point is kind of a challenge I had faced, uh, like technical complexity, right? So some of the technical terms cannot be easily translatable, right? Some of them had some some technical jargons. So uh, it's like you have to keep it the way it is in the document, uh, irrespective of the language you are writing to, right? You know, uh, in some region, let's say, uh, you know, take an example of bandwidth, the word bandwidth. In some regions, that's been considered as a different meaning and uh, in European region, it's been considered as a different meaning. So uh, you, but for that specific technology, you'd have to keep that word. So how do I overcome this? It's like, again, 
have a style guide with all the you know, terminologies explained. So this terminology, let's say bandwidth, this is you no know, particular to this particular software. So this means this. So you have all the uh, you know, uh, jargons explained in the style guide, formatting standards that you have used in your document in the style guide and share that with the uh, target audience. Uh, in this way, you can actually you know, avoid uh, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, support calls. I should say that because that, you know, uh, that way they actually you know, uh, you know, uh, reduce the support calls when, when I was working in my previous organization. So I even attended, you know, uh, like we have started attending uh, calls uh, back then. You, even we used to attend the customer calls and, you know, uh, let them know that we have this document. Uh, please go through this and uh, let us know what is your feedback. So uh, I uh, got chance of attending some of the calls wherein content was internationalized. So that way we got one of the feedback saying some of the terms are not easily understandable. So. What they did, they came up with a glossary or a kind of document. You know, uh, back then all the documents were in PDF. They had to put it in the uh, website. So they came up with a document with all the jargons and uh, everything technical terms explained in the document, and uh, they put it across. So that actually reduced some of the support calls as well. Next is again cultural uh, cultural differences. As I earlier uh, said, it's like you will have to be extremely sure. Uh, uh, when you are writing to different uh, region, like some of the, you know, you, you understand their culture, the way they actually take a document, how do they actually, what, is, what are their perceptions on a document? What are they looking out for? So those things you will have to understand. Again, knowing your audience comes into picture here. So that is one of the complexity. Uh, so what you have to do is talk to the cultural expert or you know, a, a, a expertized translator would also help you. Right, no, no, you can actually uh, write uh, in this way. So that is one of the complexity again. Um, uh, the other point I would like to mention is, you know, um, uh, analyzing the entire translated content or, you know, cross-checking the content for the accuracy. So it's like uh, some of the features been not, uh, not available for a particular region. So again, uh, you just have to go through the entire content again and make sure that a uh, specific feature is hidden for that particular region. So this kind of you know, uh, going through the entire content, uh, making sure the technical accuracy of that content is one of the uh, complex things. But uh, I, I think back then we had no other option but to you know, sit and read the entire document or at least you know, check the steps whether it's, it's, it's technically accurate or not, right? Uh, <clears throat> and version controls. Uh, again, what uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the other company used to follow the version numbers as well. Let's say it's like uh, support assist one dot wo. The patch release would have support assist one dot one, which is a very minor release, right? So your document should also be originally controlled, right? So and it it might be uh, an addition of line in the document, you know. So that way, you know, maintaining the version of that particular document and having that uh, content available for all the uh, regions is one of the complexity that I've uh, faced. <clears throat> Lastly, but not the least, legal and compliance thing, right? So copyright things, uh, uh, when you are writing to Japanese, let's say, uh, some of the uh, sudden things you'll have to keep in mind. So uh, you have a team, legal and compliance team. So when, especially when the uh, document is getting translated, so it has to go through the legal and compliance team. Right, so to you know to adhere to their uh, compliance and regulatory uh, uh, writing regulations. So that is one thing again. So you might get a lot of you know feedback from them saying this has to be removed, this has to be removed, or this has to be rewritten. So that is one of the complexity uh, that I've faced. Yeah, I think overall, you know, uh, when you are actually uh, changing a minor thing uh, as a localization, which is an easy thing, but you know, when your content is uh, getting translated for different language, uh, then uh, you know it, it's it's extremely difficult. The way of writing should be, you know, uh, more crisp, and uh, you be up to the point, and you know, use more much neutral language, which is understandable and which which can be easily translated. As Vipana rightly said, I mean, translating it. it it goes on the uh, word basis, right? Cost would go on word basis, so which is very costly. Uh, so uh, again, it will be kind of you know, uh, heavy for the company. So you would, I mean, they expect you to write in in, in such a way that it is easily translatable. So uh, maybe, yeah, I think I've covered uh, most of the points. 
Thanks, Palguna. Thank you for sharing your experience. And I think it definitely uh, helps us understand what goes behind localizing content. Uh, all right. My next question is to Shetra. As a technical writer uh, who's familiar with authoring content for a foreign audience, what advice would you give to tech writers who are new to internationalization, uh, especially in terms of best practices? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tisha. I mostly covered most of the points in the previous answer, but again, reiterating them as best practices um, would be firstly, conduct a thorough, comprehensive, you know, competitor analysis. Begin with a thorough competitor analysis, focus on the key players in the targeted geography, understand which product is in demand, what transaction types is going on there, the user profiles. I think all of this forms a solid foundation for content creation. The second would be uh, tailor the content to local parameters, identify and study the existing content for adaptation, eliminate any uh, region specific terminologies, ensure that the language resonates with the target audience. Um, the third point would be create a checklist, like mentioned, develop a checklist derived from the competitor analysis so that it includes aspects like, you know, currency variation, ensure the examples for the specific geography, the terminologies that are not supposed to be used, and so on. And again, this checklist will also help in the thorough self-review um, process as well. The fourth point would be emphasize understanding the local culture. That is, highlight the importance of understanding local culture and language differences. This ensures that the content is not only linguistically accurate, but culturally relevant as well. Uh, the fifth point would be keep an eye on the users. Um, I think Vinita also mentioned this point. Recognizing that the job continues even after documentation is important. Engage with users through methods like user interviews. Know, understand how the users are interacting with the content. And of course, uh, post that you get in insights where you can work on the um, improvement of the content. Sixth point would be uh, use the anal analytics wisely. Again, we have a lot of tools that we can use to crunch the numbers to see what's popular on SEO and what words the users are typing. This info again tells us how user behaves, uh, how, how users are behaving and what they like in our documentation. The last point would be stay up. Now this is a staying in loop with the market or whatever is happening in the market. Uh, this also includes staying in loop with the product manager, maintaining good, good rapport with the stakeholders. Uh, knowing about any new stuff the users might be looking for, staying up on the trends helps, you know, keep our content fresh and useful. Um, to summarize or wrap up the whole points is um, understanding different cultures, using tech tools smartly, learning continuously, and of course, staying in the loop with um, user feedback and market trends would be the best practices, I would say. Thanks, Shetra. Thank you for sharing your inputs. I would encourage our uh, panelists and anyone in the audience to share their thoughts or if you all have any questions. All right. As we wrap up our episode, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our amazing panelists for sharing their insights and expertise with us today. A big thank you to our audience for being a part of this episode. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of our journey. Follow us on LinkedIn and Spotify and stay tuned for updates on the upcoming season.